And so turn with me again to 1 Samuel uh, chapter 17, starting at verse 1. And I'm going to read. The Bible says, don't worry about the Philistines. I'm echoing a little bit, son. Don't worry about the Philistines, David told Saul. Oh, my God, look at that faith. Young teenager. So don't worry about all what's going on. Oh, my God. I'll go fight him. And then look at the king. He said, don't be ridiculous. Saul replied, there's no way you can fight. Be careful who you're talking to. I gotta fix my mic, son. The king, his oversight, cousin Sean, his, his, the person that's supposed to be leading him, watch this, Pastor Tedrick, the person that's supposed to be over him, the person that's supposed to be leading him. Do you really know who's leading you? Do, do you really know what you're submitting to? Listen to the king tell his young warrior. Don't be ridiculous. Saul replied, there's no way you can fight this Philistine. Some of the things, some of y'all been held back because of the people that you connected to. And you're afraid to make a decision because you, you want to be popular in people's eyes instead of in God's eyes. You choose to obey people instead of obey God. Don't do that. Don't do that. Obey God. Is it right to obey man, minister, all of us? Is it right to obey God every time? If it come down to me and you, I'm going to always choose God over you. And I'm your pastor. I just made that declaration. I will never choose you before I choose God. That's Bible. That's not pride. That's Bible. Saul replied, there's no way you can fight this Philistine and possibly win. You're only a boy. And he's been a man of war since youth. But David persisted. Oh, you got to have some tenacity about yourself. I have been taking care of my father's sheep. Look what he quoted to the king. I've been taking care of my father's sheep and goats. Ooh, my, in the kingdom, there will be some goats. Everybody ain't going in. I don't care what the world say. It wouldn't be in there if, if everybody was going to be saved. Even in the church house. Even with your name being on the deacon board, the elders board, and, and hospitality board, and greeters board, and, and, and first... Thank you, Lord. He says, when a lion or a bear comes to steal the lamb from the flock, I go after it with a club and rescue the lamb from his mouth. If the animal turns on me, I catch it by the jaw. This is David talking. And, cl and club it to death. I have, done this both I have done this to both lions and bear. And I'll do it to this pagan Philistine. Ooh, look at that statement. My God. He says, for, for he has defied the armies of the living God. So he'd have made David mad. A teenager, 16 to 17 years old, is mad because he's disrespecting, as we say in the streets, he's dis dis disrespecting the set. He's disrespecting God's set. Come on, somebody. How many people are sitting around you disrespecting God? You ain't got nothing in you to do something about it. How many people is mocking and talking about Christianity, your brothers and sisters, your, and you just sit there and just tuck your tail? Do you not have a cause? Oh, when God, when David heard this Philistine disrespecting God's people, something rose up. My God. Oh, you got to be alive for something to rise up in you, baby. Oh, I'm trying to move forward. Ah, uh, the word of God is so good. That's why you need to read the word of God. It's good. It's good. My God. Mm, I done lost my place. He said, defying the armies of the living God. Verse 20, 37 said, the Lord who rescued me from the claws of the lion and the bird will rescue me from this Philistine. That's faith. He remember God did it then. He's going to do it now. And then the Bible says Saul finally consent, consented. All right, go ahead, he said, and, and, and may the Lord be with you. So Saul now recognized that God was with David. Look at the scripture, y'all, and may the Lord be with you. Then Saul gave, his own, gave, gave David his own armor, a bronze helmet and a coat of mail. David put it on, strapped on the sword over it, and took a step or two to see what it was like, for he had never worn such things. Dick, look what David said, I can't go in these, he protested. To Saul, I'm not used to them. Quit trying to fight with other people's armor. So David took them off again. He picked up five smooth stones from a stream and put them into a shepherd's bag. Then armed, my God, then armed only with his shepherd's staff and sling, he started across the valley to fight the Philistines. Father, thank you. Teach us. Loose my tongue and hide me. And when you hide me, show yourself. I get out the way, now you get in the way. Save somebody's soul. Restore somebody that don't know you. Restore somebody that's walked away from you. Father God, don't let us shout. Don't let us clap. Don't let us say amen if we're not ready to shift and confront. 
that what is mocking, that what is tormenting, that what is destroying our legacy, that what is hindering our progress in the kingdom. We, sh we come before your throne and humble this Father. And we thank you for the privilege to do business in your kingdom. Touch your people today, Lord. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. You may be seated in the presence of the Lord. As I set this up, I got a little reading to do, so y'all just bear with me. As I get ready for the introduction, get your pen and your paper, turn on your phone, or get your iPad ready or whatever you're going to be using, because I need you to take notes. My God, I'm settled in my spirit right now, so if I don't finish, it's okay. I take it up on Wednesday if the Lord delays coming. But this is a powerful saying. It's been in my spirit. God dropped it in my spirit. Down goes Goliath, and that's a powerful thought. And it's a powerful concept, my God, that you can build to and build from, my God. But you're going to have to do things the way God wants you to do it. Some of us is very right now frustrated in the house of the Lord because we're trying to change. We're trying to do things, but we're trying to do it in the arm of the flesh. Some of us is even trying to do it in the spirit, but we're out of God's timing. Y'all better stay with me, church. Come on now. Come on. Stay with me. Some of us, my God, we may be doing something even in the spirit, but you got to make sure you're doing it in his timing. Timing is everything when you're dealing with a holy God. You got to remember, we quote the familiar scripture, my thoughts is not your thoughts and my ways is not your ways. If we understood that, then we'll make sure that we in step with God's timing. Because then when we are in step with God's timing, when we are rhythm, the kingdom dances to a rhythm. Many of us is trying to serve in God's kingdom, but we're dancing and operating and moving to the world's rhythm. That's the word. Wor See, some of us are so going so fast, we can't even hear God. We won't even take time to read. We just move it. We just move it. God's rhythm is consistent. God never gets off beat. When you and I, y'all need to follow me, when you and I, I don't care how old you is, I don't care how, how, how young you are, when you and I start trying to move to your rhythm, you're in trouble. One of the greatest weapons that my spiritual father warned me about, and my leaders will catch this, is don't let the devil speed you up. Don't try to get ahead. And usually when you try to get speed up because you want something to happen now. Oh, you got a reason because your motive's not right because you want everybody to take notice of you now. Some of you, when you find yourself frustrated, just walk, take on your hour break or your hour lunch or your 10 minute break, just walk around your building and snap your fingers. That should slow you down. And that should remind you to get back in God's rhythm. Many people are frustrated, hear me, y'all, because you're out of rhythm with God's kingdom. Full of the scripture. You mean well, everything's good, but you're out of rhythm. I am reminded of Israel's trouble with giants. Of course, you take this all the way back to Numbers chapter 13 and 14. Y'all stay with me. After two years in the wilderness, Israel had arrived at the banks of the Jordan River. God had promised them the land. Listen to this, church. God has promised them the land, and God has promised us some land. Now watch this. It says, on the other side of the Jordan. Oh, my God, everybody got a red sea and a Jordan across. You will never possess, my God, your Canaan until you cross the Jordan, until you cross the Red Sea. A lot of our freedom is just a little beyond, a little yonder, going up yonder, the Jordan. You can see it, but it's so big and it's so wide. You see so many problems. You see so many trials to where even though you know your promise, your future, your happiness, your better, your next, your promotion, whatever it is, it's just on the other side of the Jordan. But because you're looking at flesh, my God, you're looking at sight is where you're at, vision is where you're going. You're looking at what you see by the natural eye, and it's discouraging you. So you'll stay on this side of the Jordan yeah. when everything God called you to is on that side. Yeah. And so when you was in on this side of the Jordan, y'all stay with me. Everything was suffice. It satisfied you. Now some of you, it's time to cross over because that what used to satisfy you. Ooh, stay with me, cousin Sean. That what used to satisfy you on this side of the Jordan ain't going to satisfy you no more. And so now you got to cross over to the other side. To go on from faith to faith to glory to glory. Many of you are stuck on this side and you're not happy. Christianity is boring to you now. See what I'm trying to say? It's like you're wandering around in the wilderness because you're stuck on this side when God has commissioned and promised you to cross over to the other side. 
Are y'all with me so far? Okay. <clears throat> they stopped by. My God, they stopped, but they stopped. They stopped to, to send spies. God told them to cross over, but they stopped to send spies to examine the land. Okay, I'll take that. Well, my God, when those spies returned, they reported that the land was good. But it, but, it, but it was a land inhabited by many great giants. In fact, ten spies were absolutely terrified of the giants they had seen there. But Caleb and Joshua, who I love them, who had seen the same giants, tried their best to trust, my God, tried to, their best to get the people to trust, enter, and claim. Write those words down. Ten, Twelve people went over. Ten was terrified. God used two people. Two means agreement. Two means accountability. Two means covenant. Oh, my God. God used Caleb and Joshua, my God. Out of ten, 12 people, my God, only two people seen and vision what God had in store. Who are you walking with this afternoon? And so, my God, Caleb and Joshua tried to get the people to trust. It's a system, my God, to enter and then claim. You got to trust, you got to enter, and then you got to claim your promised land. But the people listened to the majority's report and refused to battle their giants. How are you refusing to move forward? Because you listened to your mama's report, your grandma's report. Are you, are, are you allowing the enemy to bring up in your mind, my God, things that, they, that your people or your loved ones or your people that was in your, your authority figures told you what you couldn't do. People told you it was nothing. You would never amount to nothing. You would never accomplish nothing. You're going to always be on section eight. You're going to always be in believe. My God, are you believing that more than God's report for your life? Are you believing that? Well, this is the way. They're all my family, everybody go, gets married and get a divorce. Everybody, my God, end up being drug addicts and, and prostitutes and all that old mess. Are you believing that? Some of you have. But today is a day of deliverance. Look at your neighbor and say, I'm crossing over this time. Oh, my God, this is good. This is good, my God. You cannot refuse to battle, my God, your giants. Because you and I have refused to battle our giants, as a result, they were all, talking about the nation, was, was condemned to 38 more years of wandering in the wilderness. 38 more years of wandering. After 38 years, they arrived back at the Jordan River, the same river they didn't want to cross because they was fearful to go in, because they listened to the wrong people. And so 38 years later, when it came back around, Cousin Sean, to that same Jordan, Keisha, that they told God told them to cross 38 years ago, guess what happened? Watch this. Because of that, after 38 years, they arrived back at the Jordan River. Moses speak to them to prepare them to enter Canaan. As he does, he lets them know that they are about to face some giants on the other side of the Jordan. You get that in Deuteronomy 1 and 2, and I'm almost finished. Israel fled from those giants 38 years before. When the, ch when the children came back, 38 years later, y'all, the giants were still there. God allowed the parents, my God, to wander in the wilderness and die off. And while they was in the wilderness wondering, wondering they had children. And when the time came for the children to cross over, they had to face, watch the, ooh, thank you, Holy Ghost. They had to face, my God, the children. Listen to me, parents and grandparents, uncles and aunties, daddies, the same giants that they didn't face 38 years later, my God. Now, your parents, you have left your children to deal with something you should have killed a long time ago. I said, you should have killed them a long time ago, babe. That's where we go with who in my life got to suffer while I remain the same. So some of your kids right now is dealing with some giants, dealing with some strongholds, dealing with some generational stuff that you refuse to confront and kill. Yeah. 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 Now your kids, you wonder why everything going on with your kids? Well, my God, because you ain't did what God told you to do on this side of the Jordan. And now you have ran for 38 years, my God, wandering in the wilderness. You cool because you got a little 401k. You cool because you got a car with some air conditioning in the summer and some heat in the winter. You cool because you can pay your bills and buy a purse or buy some shoes here and there. Come on, somebody. But at the end of the day, you ain't conquered nothing, my God. You're just existing. My God, my God, you're just existing, but you're not conquering. See, it's one thing to exist. It's another thing to conquer. Oh, my God, Joshua, my God, was a conquering people. Moses, my God, my God, delivered the people. But Joshua, my God, caused the people to possess the land. They was conquering people. I'm raising up conquering people. I'm not raising up people wandering in the wilderness. I'm not raising up people always making excuses. I'm not raising up no crab babies. I'm raising up warriors, my God. Your pastor's a warrior, so I got to raise up warriors, baby. Who am I talking to in the church? My God, do I got any warriors in the church? So now, my God, their children is dealing with the same giants that they ran from. You may not want to face your giants. You may want to run from them in fear. That's a giant. You may want to avoid them. You need to know that your giants will not just go away. 
Please stay with me. They must be faced. And they can be. That's faith. Be defeated. The giants you are facing this afternoon can be defeated. And the scriptures tell us how to accomplish that. And so I'm giving you the word of God. I'm giving you the word of God, line upon line, precept upon precept. Please don't look for the excitement and catch the principles. God may, my God, his dealings and his shiftings may change, but God's principles never change. If it worked 2,000, 3,000 years ago, it worked today, baby. I said God's dealings, baby, cold may change. How he do stuff. Oh, my God, he may adjust and adapt, my God. He may save this way and then turn around tomorrow and save that way. He may deliver you right here and let you stay, linger a little bit right there. But his principles about him never change because his principles is his character. And God's character never changed. I can't get nobody to say nothing right there. And so you got to understand, my God, when you're serving the God that we serve, my God, his character never changes. His principles never changes, but his methods do. This cause what he did last year don't mean he's going to do it like that this year. And so put point number one on the screen. I just feel like teaching. And so has God been dealing with me? So this is the key right here. You're going to have to have the right motives if you're going to kill your giants. Ask yourself, what is your motive for wanting to be free? Because God set you free to be worshipped. God set you free so he can be worshipped. He didn't set you free so you could dance and prance around talking about you free, but you ain't doing nothing for the kingdom. When God set you free, it's for his purpose to go back and bring glory to his kingdom. Yeah. And so if you want to kill some giants so you can say that you're free, uh, you're tired, you tired of suffering, my God. you tired. That's okay. My God has been defeated and you want to be free. But do you want to be free for the glory of God? Or do you just want to be free because you're tired of suffering? Because yeah. see, if you want to be free because you're tired of suffering, that's not enough for God to deliver you. Because yeah. the Bible says, my God, everything he does, he wants the glory. Yeah. And so you got to make sure your motives is right. For the reason why you want God to do the things that you are asking him to do in your life. That even goes to our prayer life. Some of our prayers are not being answered because our motive's not right. Oh, let me get off on this because I could teach you all day. Let me give you a little bit of this background. Background here. David's father, Jesse, has sent David to bring some supplies to three of David's brothers who were fighting in Saul's army. When David arrives at the battlefield, he finds Saul and his armies of Israel cowering in fear. Because of the taunts and the threats of the giant named Goliath. Goliath was nine feet, nine inches tall. He wore armor that weighed 175 pounds. He carried a spear that weighed 32 pounds. Listen to me, church. This giant was covered in brass from head to toe. This is all in the scripture. For 40 days and 40 nights. Jesus was tempted 40 days and 40 nights. My God, they stayed in the wilderness 40 days. Years. 40 in the Bible is a generation. Who am I, God? In our time, a generation is 10. But in the Bible, 40 is a generation. Y'all stay with me. 40 is a number, baby. And it has very significance in God's kingdom. Do a study on numbers. Come on, somebody. So, my God, for 40 days and 40 nights, the giant taunted them and challenged them. Can I tell you, my God, that your giants that you are leaving unattended and the ones you won't kill, they are taunting you? Even as I speak, they are mocking and laughing at you. Some of our giants are sitting right beside us, and we don't even know them. I'm sorry. Don't, don't go home and fight now. But, uh, but, uh, but, but for 40 days, my God, for 40 days, to keep it in context, for 40 days, Goliath, nine feet tall, was taunting, taunting, disrespecting the people of God. How long have you allowed your giant to disrespect you, mock you? How long have you allowed your giant to just come into your house and take your kids away from you? How long have you allowed the giant, my God, to come in and bring division to the marriage and you just gave up and signed a divorce? How long have you allowed yourself to allow depression, my God, to cause you to self-sabotage and stay in your room? How long have you allowed the spirit of suicide? How long have you allowed low self-esteem and lack of confidence? How long have you allowed sexual sin and fear and lack of trust and no faith? These are giants. That's why I'm calling them out like that. How long have you allowed, my God, some of us is dragging. Oh, my God, we dragging our giants. Y'all look at me, baby. We are dragging our giants. How how long are you going to continue to drag your giant? How long is you going to allow your giants, my God, to mock you? How long is you going to allow your giants to follow behind you? Come on, somebody. How long, how long, how long is you going to continue to let the enemy disrespect you when you have all authority on the inside of you, when you have power to do something about it, when God has given you authority, when God has given you his word to do something about it, instead of you digging, my God, instead of you seeking God, my God, you're just going to walk around, my God, with your giants. 
attached to you. My God, we are wounded in the spirit, my God. Oh, my God, that's why many of them have shipwrecked from going over Christ's church because it's too painful because we don't want to deal with our giants. Some of us keep our giants super glued to us. Some of our giants just change to our ankle, and no matter how cute we look and no matter how handsome we are, we're dragging our giants around, dragging our giants around, addictions and all of those type of stuff. My God, we just dragging it around, and we have been allowed in churches to sit because there ain't no power. There ain't no conviction going on. The pastors in the pool pits ain't challenging you to do better. The pastors ain't telling you, my God, that greater is he that lives in you than he that's in the world. You sitting in churches where they're not provoking you to do nothing different. They don't curb, my God, but this pastor over here and going over Christ's curb, you are free and I curb at you. Somebody give God a hand. Sitting in these churches with all they're concerned about it. I'm not putting on down. I'm careful, baby. My God, worried about numbers. But quit dragging your giants and confront your giants. 38 years later, my God, we still dealing with the same giants. Oh, by now you ought to be on the other side of the Jordan. By now you should have broke camp in advance. The word of God said you've been at this mountain too long. How long is you going to continue to be defeated? How long is you going to continue to let this mess dominate you and mock you? Sooner or later, something got to rise up on the inside of you. Oh, you got to get to the point where you're sick and tired of being sick and tired. Where you ready to adjust and adapt and do something about it. Hey, you got to have a cause, baby. Somebody give God a hand. Oh, I'm trying to provoke you to move. Yeah, mm. yeah, yeah, yeah. The giants taunted him and challenged him to bring someone to fight. When David spoke of killing the giant, watch this. His motives was questioned. Anytime you make your mind up to do something different, people are going to question your motives. So you know what? Can I say this to you? Some of y'all need to remember this because it's Bible. Some people need you to stay in Egypt because it makes them feel better. Some people need you to stay in Egypt. Egypt in the Bible represents captivity. At our day and time, it means the world. Some people want you to go to church but still go to the club, still live like a devil because it makes them feel comfortable. They're saying if she can live like that, then it's okay for me to live like that. Who in my life had to suffer because I'm remaining the same? Some people need you to stay sick. Mm. Anytime you decide that you're going to break camp in advance, and do great things for God, people are going to always question. Why are you trying to do that? Girl, please. Boy, please, you ain't going to come on. Ain't nobody going to want you. You got too many kids. This your fourth marriage. Ain't nobody going to want you, girl. That's how the enemy mocks and taunts. Some of you right now, my God, has accepted that voice. The Bible squeak, my God, uh, 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 Ron McIntosh teaches us in our discipleship class. That's why you need to sign up for classes. Whatever voice is the loudest in your mind, in your ear, that's the voice you're going to navigate to. Yeah. Is God's voice loud? Because if God's voice is loud, it's going to pull you. The Bible says those of God heard the things of God. Yeah. Whatever voice is the loudest in your life, whatever voice is the loudest in your ear, that's the voice you're going to focus on. That's the voice you're going to submit to. If God's voice is not loud, you're not going to submit to God. If the kingdom of heaven is not loud, you're not going to try to live in the kingdom. My God, if you don't understand the importance of community and fellowship, you're not going to hit and miss church. If you don't understand the benefits of being connected to a 12, you allow the enemy and flesh to disconnect you from a 12. Because you think you can do this all by yourself. My God, trust me, David killed a giant, but he didn't do it by himself. There was a whole lot of preparation. And when David stepped up, my God, to face Goliath, oh, my God, the king fell and realized, although he was in his, in his flesh by himself, but he had God Almighty walking with him. I can't get nobody to say nothing right there. Oh, my God, so it's a lot of things that you and I can't do. There are some giants that you need help conquering. That's why the Bible says two is better than one. That's why the Bible talks about woman of God. My God, how can two people walk together except there be agreement? Some giants you were killed by yourself. Other giants you need some help. Woo, my God, I can't get nobody. Oh, y'all looking at me like I'm crazy. Yeah, yeah. And that's why you can't kill it. And that's why it's keep taunting you because you're trying to kill it by yourself. Because you feel like you can do this by yourself. Even Jesus, God in the flesh, my God, depended on the spirit of the living God to help him do. He couldn't conquer the temptation in the wilderness. It took the Father, the Son, and the Holy Ghost to help him conquer, my God, that temptation that the devil was throwing at him. Oh, my God, this is good teaching. Oh, my God, people always question why you want to do great things. Listen to God's voice instead of listening to man's voice. Quit listening to your mama's and grandma's voice. They don't know. Some of them ain't never done nothing, so therefore they don't expect for you to do nothing. Oh, I'm not being insistent. It's the truth. I'm not being insistent. It's the truth. What voice is the loudest in your life? Whichever voice is the loudest in your life, that's the voice you're going to submit to. 
And I pose this question, even as your pastor. Many of us come every Sunday and every Wednesday. And some of us are even in 12s. But my voice ain't loud in their life. Right. Attendance don't mean that my voice, God's voice through me is loud in a person's life. No matter how much you're around the church, don't mean that my voice is matters in your life. And one of our giants is we struggle with submission to authority, especially in African American culture. And we dumb down our leaders and say, you just a man or a woman just like me. So we could, we, we, boy, that's why you got to go to class. We dealt with this stuff. See what I'm trying to say? And so we dumb down your man of God and try to bring him down. People try to bring Jesus down, say he's just a prophet. Or he just old. See, you can't, I'm going to let you bring me down. Not, 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 to where, not, not to where you think I'm just shoveling sheep dung and I don't matter. The devil is a lie. But you'll never know, my God. I teach my leaders, my God, you could thank you, my God, has a place in somebody's life. You'll never know where you stand with somebody until you're challenged. Until there's friction. Until there's turbulence. My God, I'll never know where you at, my God, as one of my sons. I'm supposed to be sons of dollars in the faith until I have to talk you off the ledge. Until you're doing stuff that, my God, I got to correct your butt, my God, and then you get mad and leave the church. Yeah. Oh, my God, I promise you, I promise you, I promise you, my yeah. God. You never know where they at, woman of God. Yeah. You never know where they at, woman of God. You never know where they at, woman of God. My God, and most of our people, especially in the body of Christ, struggle with right. submission to authority. Exactly right. And so guess what? You stay on the other side of Jordan for 38 yeah. more years. Because God cannot, thank you, Holy Ghost, he just gave it to me. He cannot promote you. Because if you struggle with authority and submission on that end, when you get to this end, you're going to show enough have a problem. And so many of you are staying low when you should be high, but your heart ain't right. Oh, this is that type of word. We talking about killing a giant. Somebody say, down go Goliath. Everything that the Spirit of God has said is going to take to kill your giants. And so people always question your motives. Some people, may have, some people may have thought that David was motivated by financial rewards offered to the man who killed Goliath. His brother Elab, his brother, flesh and blood, Elab, speaking out of jealousy, tried to accuse David of promoting himself. Verse 28 in the Word of God says, But when David's oldest brother, Elab, talking to the men, he was angry. His oldest brother was angry because David was amongst the soldiers asking, what's going on? Who is this? What is this man talking about? Who is that over there? Defy who, what is that I heard? Oh, my God. The Bible said those of God heard that. David, my God, something stirred up in David. My God, so he started coming through the crowd. He wasn't nothing but a teenager, so he started bobbing and weaving. He started adjusting and adapting because he was probably shorter, so he moving through the crowd. He's trying to get to somebody can give me some answers. Who is this person that he called me out? Who is this person, my God, that's mishandling the people of God? Oh, my God, do you got a cause? I'm stuck right there. Do you got a cause? Mm. Oh, my God. So David, my God, start moving around. What are you doing here anyway, his brother said. He demanded. What about those few sheep you're supposed to be taking care of? I know, I know about your pride and deceit. That's what his brother said. You just want to see the battle. But see, what his brother, my God, failed to realize, I taught y'all last week, that my God, Samuel, my David, anointed, my Samuel anointed David in the presence of his brothers. So David already had, my God, the king's anointing on him. But his brother forgot, my God, oh, my God, that his brother was the next king in line. And so you talking about he jealous now. He just operating in his authority. Come on, somebody. Oh, my God. Oh, he forgot how soon people forget, my God. His brother Elab, Sean, forgot, my God, that this is the king, my God. You finna bow down to him, my God. Even though he's 17, baby, you getting ready to bow down to the king, baby. And so, my God, so it wasn't about no financial rewards, because guess what? Thank you, Holy Ghost, he just gave it to me. My God, he already had the financial work because he was the next king in line. He already had it, my God. It can't be about the cheese, because he was the next king. He had everything. Somebody give God a hand. I'm still talking about the motive. See, David's motive, I'm watching the time. David's motive came into question. And people around him tried to question his motives, like people around you questioning your motive. That's why you keep hearing me redundantly say, what voice is the loudest? Are you going to believe God's report about you? But see, many of us, my God, God's voice is not loud because we're not in his word. As I love what Pastor Teresa said, if you want to know God's ways, you got to read his word because God's ways is his word. You don't have to fast for 40 days. Read his word. His word is going to tell you what to do. Woo, 
Shandalalobo. Thank you, son. I receive it. My God, I receive it. And so you got to understand, people will question you. Even, my God, those that is close to the Holy Ghost, even those that's closest to David, question his motives. Even your own family members will question why you're trying to do what you're trying to do. Yeah. Why all of a sudden you're trying to get out of this? This is all we ever done. Yeah. Why are you trying to be better? What you talking about going back to school for? Girl, you're too old. You got great grandkids. Why are you getting out of school? What you trying? See, see, you got to be careful because this is the type of stuff that's keeping us on the other side of the joint. And then when we get around people like we learned in class to provoke you and challenge you, uh-huh. it gets so uncomfortable, you shipwreck and run. See, my God, when you got people that God, my God, has given you, like Minister Lenny Tao, biblical, my God, advice, biblical encouragement, my God, scripture to help you cross over your Jordan. Instead of you willing, willing to cross over, you deal with the lack of trust. A lot of us, my God, have not crossed over because we don't trust God like we say we do. You got to trust, enter, and possess. Claim. Trust, enter, and claim. Trust God, enter into what he told you to do, and possess it. That means claim it. And when you store a function like that, I promise you, that what is connected to you that's unhealthy will fall off. Many of you are dragging giants because you ain't trust, you didn't enter, and you didn't claim. You didn't possess. Start doing those principles and you watch what happened in your life. But you got to rise past what people think. You know how many people question your pastor, Juju, from the start of church? Juju? You know your pastor used to be a gang banger. You know your pastor used to be on drugs. All my members just went through that. They said, yeah, he talk about that all the time. You ain't telling me anything. And every time somebody got something to say about your pastor, they always talking about what I did, Keisha, when I, before I get, became a Christian. They ain't never said what I've been doing since I've been a Christian. Come on. Come on. That's what they, do. they ain't never questioned my integrity as a man of God. They may talk about me being a gangster, but they ain't never talking about he's a hypocrite. He ain't living nothing. If they did, they lying. Bring him here. I confront every giant, every lying giant. The Bible says every tongue that rises up against me shall be utterly cast out. Any one of your friends, any one of your mamas, your daddies, your grandmas got something to say, put him by her. I confront my giant. My lifestyle match what I preach, baby. That's why many of you follow me, baby. Ain't no shame in my game, baby. I'm transparent and real as they come, baby. They don't come too much realer than this pastor. That ain't pride. That's just confidence in God. I can't get nobody to say nothing right there. Follow me at home. Watch my finances. Watch my wife. Watch my kids, baby. It's in order in mine. Everything's in order. Cars, the crib, everything, baby. You can follow this pastor. I said, you can follow this pastor. Ain't no hypocrisy up in there, baby. Yeah, yeah, yeah. See, y'all not used to that right there. Take it with you. Take it with you because you can't stop what God is doing over here in my life, baby. It's God. It's God. I promise you. It's still God. It is God way down in my soul. Oh, my God. Hey, don't get me started. I'm trying to teach my God. Oh, my God, I'm confident in Christ. I said I'm confident in Christ. I won't let none of my members, all of my so-called sons, stop the momentum of God either, baby. I can't get nobody to say nothing like that. Your voice ain't stronger than God's voice, not in my life, baby. I said your voice ain't stronger than God's voice in my life. I'm an alpha male. Alpha male. Let's go a little deeper. I'm just trying to encourage you, though, because some of y'all need to hear that. Not for me, but for you. Some of you are stopped and shipwrecked on the other side of Jordan because you're too concerned about people yeah. instead of worrying about God. And you're powerful. Yeah. You got gifts in you. My God, you got potential in you. Yeah. Oh, my God, like I told y'all last week, who's the next Obama in here? My God, who's the next first lady in here of the world? Come on, somebody. What are you sitting on that God is waiting to discover inside of you? Leadership is self-discovery. When you discover yourself, you discover the leader within. All you witness is somebody that discovered himself in a six by nine prison cell, and I accepted that I'm fearfully wanted to be made. I accepted that God has a great plan for me. All you got to do is accept it like I did and let God change your life, baby. Hey, hey, Jesus. Just accept it, my God. Trust God. Trust him, Luana. Trust him. Trust him. Everything you're going through ain't the devil. And some of the giants, my God, that you see as giants, it's your belief system. Oh, my God, ain't even a physical giant, my God, it's in your mind. Majority of the churches, my God, is defeated. Majority of the people in church, because they defeated in their mind. That's why Paul, Solomon said, as a man thinking, so he becomes. You and I are some total of your own thoughts. If you don't like what's manifesting external, you got to look at what you're thinking about internal. Oh, my God, my God, whatever you're seeing, whatever fruit, my God, oh, my God, there's manifesting. This cause is manifesting from the internal. And fruit don't mean it's always good fruit. Oh, I'm flowing. Fruit don't mean it's always good fruit. If you don't like what's manifesting external, look at what's going on internal. 
you and I are a sum total of our belief system. David had a powerful belief system at 17 years old. God used sheep and goats to train David. Wasn't nobody back there with David but God, those sheep, those goats, and himself. Didn't nobody know what God was doing? Your brother said, go on back over there with them sheep. Oh, they don't know that God was building a warrior. God was positioning the next king to take over. Oh, my God. Thank you, Holy Ghost. I'm sorry, but it's the Bible. Mm. I believe that David was motivated by two things. Y'all flow with me. And it wasn't the money, because he already had that. Oh, my God. Power and fame. It wasn't no street. Oh, my God. Money, power, and fame. That usually generates, my God, and motivates the people of God. Money, power, and fame. Watch them. It's okay to have money. It's okay to have a little fame. The Bible says a good reputation is more to be desired than gold and silver. It's okay to have a healthy rep reputation. Ain't nothing wrong with that. You need to have a re healthy rep reputation when you're a Christian. You don't want people questioning you as a Christian. You don't want people looking at you as a, un uh, as, as a hypocrite. You don't want people saying, my God, who am I God? Tanya is supposed to be coming, but she's going to be late. She's just always late. That's a bad witness. Well, Tanya, I'm just using you about daughters, okay? Tanya, Tanya says she's going to be here, but, you know, she always talking about she's going to do something, but she don't never show up. But you see her at church, she always up there worshiping, going hard with pastor peoples and worshiping and walking around and praying for people. But she always talking about she's going to do something and never do it. That's a terrible witness. And the church is full of hypocrisy. And so we put a demand on you to live something, but it's uncomfortable. And so people won't stay. Oh, my God, they won't stay because they want to live raggedy lives. Yeah. They'll stay for a season, my God, until God starts squeezing yeah. them and start yeah. God start putting a demand on them, my God. They don't want to stop drinking. They don't want to stop whoring around. I'm talking. I know my baby's up off of them. They don't want it. And so they shipwreck. And you know what we do? Y'all know what we do? Because we want to fit in with everybody. We want to be accepted by everybody, but we don't want to be accepted by heaven, but we want to be accepted by man. So what we do, we dumb ourselves down. Yeah. We begin to compromise our standards and values because we want to fit in. And then you know what we say? Well, I'm trying to win them. I, 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 I'm trying to win them to Christ. Well, ain't it our job to be evangelists? Motive. Everything I just talked about was the wrong motive. Lord, have mercy. God, you got so much in my soul, man, to help the people, man. Mm, mm, mm. It wasn't about the money, the fame, and the power. David's reason for wanting to kill Goliath was all about the glory of God. Write that down. It was about the glory and his role as newly appointed king. Goliath, was, Goliath the giant, was mocking God, and, and, and David couldn't stand it, y'all. He couldn't stand the thought of it. Just as David had protected the sheep from the attacks of birds and lions, he would protect Israel from the attack of Goliath. Oh, my God, David knew responsibility as a king required him to eliminate the threat of Goliath. Let me give you this revelation. This is heavy. Let me slow down and give y'all this. Thank you, Lord. I feel good. Let me read that again. David's new responsibility, a new role, a new office as king required him to eliminate the threat of Goliath. God showed me this last night in prayer. Woo, thank you, Holy Ghost. Y'all listen to me. In order for David to properly possess the office of a king, he had to kill Goliath. Keep in mind, this enemy has been mocking the people of God for a long time. And so in order for, God, for David to possess, y'all watch me now, to possess and fully occupy, occupy the office of kingship over the nation, David had to kill Goliath. God even knew that. This was a Goliath, an enemy that was standing in the way of God's people for, for, for advancing farther into the promised land. So David was created for the sole purpose to kill Goliath in order for him to possess and occupy with confidence. Can you imagine? Now watch this. The reason why David had to kill Goliath because the king Saul dealt with insecurity. He dealt with jealousy. Yeah, he did. Read the scripture. See what I say? And so because his spiritual father didn't kill the giant, now he left it to his son to have to kill him. Can I, can I, can I balance that out? There's some giants you won't kill, your kid's going to kill. Oh, they missed it. Oh, somebody give God a hand. Oh, my God. When God selected, my God, when Samuel anointed Saul as king, he, had known, he knew he had insecurity and stuff like that. God knew all that. My God. But, but, but Saul wasn't the one that was supposed to kill the giant. 
I got to say this to some of y'all, and I say it again, my God, now you can catch it. Some of the giants you won't conquer. But God is raising up them seeds that's sitting beside you and all around you, my God, all your children and grandchildren. Some of them is going to kill some giants. But you and I got to make sure that the giants we're supposed to conquer and kill, we got to kill them. Because, my God, some of the giants, my God, that our kids got to deal with, they're not equipped to deal with it, my God. You are, so you got to kill it. Oh, my God, let your kids fight their own giants and you fight your giants. Come on, somebody. Who this church, this church, this church, this church. Oh, Jah. There are certain giants that your kids can't kill. You have to kill them. Don't leave your kids to battle your giants, my God. Oh, my God, because they got to carry on their own giants. They got to game bang with their own giants, baby. They got to fight their own giants, my God. And they not equipped to do it. Come on, somebody. And so God had to raise up, my God, the young soldier, my God, to kill his father's giant. And David had to kill Goliath because Goliath was standing in the way of his kingship what's standing in your way Selah what's standing in your way what Goliath it's one thing to post on Facebook as I see thank you down go Goliath but how about what's standing in your way what Goliath that you need to kill what Goliath that your mama didn't kill because it's time for you to kill him Some of our, some of our, ooh, thank you, I got to be cruel, thank you, Lord. some of mamas, some of our mamas left for us some giants that we need to kill like they didn't raise us right. So your giant is to raise your children opposite the way your mama raised you. Oof. Boy, they, <laughs> to some of my fathers, the same principle apply to you. Your father wasn't there. And if he was there, he didn't, he was there, but he wasn't there. And so, therefore, you have an opportunity to raise yours right. Yeah. Pity any man up off in her. See, this is where we got to get to manship, manhood. That you're taking care of your stepkids, which is really not stepkids, your kids, but you're not taking care of your own kids because she won't let you take care of your, own, your biological kids. But she get mad, my God, if you don't do for her kids. And you cower down because you need a place to stay in a car to drive. And so you just you defy the principles of God Shout down, go Goliath. Shout down, go Goliath. The only way that you and I, giants, is going you and I, I and you, giants, going to fall. We got to start operating in God's principles with a pure heart. The Bible says the pure in heart shall see God. See God is not when you get to heaven. They see the manifestation of God. The pure in heart. That don't mean you without sin. All of us fall short of that. But you're quick to repent as David was. The pure heart, that means you will see the manifesting, the gifts, and the callings, the miracles, the healings, and different stuff manifesting in your life. The pure heart shall see God. What's your giant? What's your giant? When you see the giants you are facing in your life, ask yourself these questions. I'm almost through. I'll finish next week. Point one, two, or whatever. When you see these giants you are facing in your life, ask yourself these questions. And I want you to write them down. Why do I want this giant defeated? Why do I want this giant defeated? Write that down. See, because the word of God in the Lord's Supper, Paul tells us to examine ourselves. Also, Paul tells us in the scriptures to examine yourself to see that you be in the faith. <laughs> so ask yourself, why do I want this giant to be defeated? What is my motive for wanting, write this down. What is my motive for wanting this giant dead? What's your motive? Why do you want it defeated? It's mocking me, pastor. It's hurting me, pastor. I'm tired, pastor. You can't sit in your church, Pastor, and continue, and God's church and continue allow these things to mock me. I got to do something different. All that sound good. All that is substance as far as wanting to see your giants defeated. But that's not God's heart. Yeah. <laughs> oh, I'm finna give it to you and get you out of here. I want to see my giants dead. I want to see my giants defeated. All that's good. 
Some of us may say, I want an easier life. Write that down. I want bragging rights. I want power in the eyes of others. Remember, we're dealing with motives. Some of us will say, I, so I can feel better. That's why I want my giants defeated. So I can do what God has called me to do. So I can cross over to the other side of the Jordan. My God, who am I going to possess that what God has for me? So my daughter and my son don't have to deal with the stuff that I didn't conquer. So, so all that's good. But that ain't what God wants. See, that sounds real good, and they probably say, oh, Pastor, what are you talking about? Watch me. In order to see your giants, my God, in our lives defeated, we must do the same two things that David did. The first thing you need to write down, you desire to see God's glory in your life. This is heavy, Tony. It's kingdom. Dr. Miles, help me, Tony. Your number one reason, my God, to see your giants defeated my God, is that you want God's glory, my God, to go out from amongst your life. The Bible says, my God, Pharaoh, let my people go, God told Moses. To tell Pharaoh, let my people go, Sarah, that they may worship me, my God. Everything God does, Brandon, he wants the glory off your life. Everything. Your giants is defeated because you want to give God the glory. Oh, that's why I testify like I do. That's why I sound a trumpet every time I do. That's why I give glory to God. I got the glory for my life, my God, because it's a testimony, and he wants the glory off of it. He did it for me, boy, so I can tell everybody that God is still a deliverer, that God is still able, that he can take a mess and turn it into power. My God, God wants the glory off your life. That's the right motive. I don't testify to brag. I testify to torment the devil and bring glory to honor to God. And many insecure men can't handle that. First Corinthians says this, First Corinthians 10 and 11. So whatever you eat or drink or whatever you do, do it all for the glory of the Lord. If you eat and drink, it's for the glory. When I kiss my wife like I did Sunday, it's for the glory. When you go shake somebody's hand, oh, thank you, Holy Ghost. When you go shake somebody's hand, see, to the, to, the, to the body of Christ, that looks good. That's very pastoral. But God's saying, what's your motive? Something as simplistic as that, Pastor Sean. God's saying, your motive wasn't right. You want everybody to praise you. You want everybody to see that you're doing the pastoral thing. And there's some substance to that. But it ain't no all the way truth to that. Everything that you do, God checks your motives. God set me free because he knew that I was going to go hard for him. He knew that I was going to give him the glory. And God knew that I wasn't going to back up. And he knew I was going to sound a trumpet. And he knew before I ever got a platform when I was in them jails, my God, I was going to tell somebody that he's able, my God. I've been faithful with this glory that God has put on my life 20 plus years. And he knew I was going to give him the glory. Will you rob God of his glory? God. Are you robbing God of his glory? God has done many things for you, like he has done for your pastors. But I'm telling it. It ain't because I got a platform. I tell it in the gym. Ain't that how you got here, Moostock? Moostock, God, I met Moostock. Stand up and raise your hand, Moostock. I met Moostock in the gym. And the power of God and anointing of God, giving God the glory, draw him to me and the rest of his history. And then from there, his wife came. This man right here, my God, watched me many, many years. I got out of prison. And I ended up way up in New York City. And he happened to see me in New York City. And he told his little dime piece the same way he is in Tulsa, the same way he is in New York. See what I say? Don't nothing change. Everything is for the glory. You know my story. Come on, woman of God. That's why you're sitting there because God told you to come sit because you know the story. Tanya, what did God tell you? I'm giving God the glory. What did God tell you? Don't just watch him studying. Everything. Testify. God delivered you from alcohol. God delivered you from crack cocaine. God delivered you from being a whore monger. Tell somebody about Jesus. Hey! You overcome behind the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Yes, God. Yes, 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 Lord. Oh, my God. The Bible says they overcome Tasha and Toya by the blood of the Lamb and the word of your testimony. Quit being scared to testify about what God has brought you out of. Oh, I'm sorry. Everything, do it for the glory. Let me give you this. I'm almost through. This should be the ultimate motivator for all of our life. Everything we do should pass through the, the filter of God's glory. Anytime you come to the house of the Lord and gather with your brothers and sisters, it should be to worship, to bring glory to God. 
And after you worship God, you should look to be a blessing to your fellow brothers and sisters. Everything. Consists of bringing glory to God. Your coming to the house of the Lord should never be, I'm just checking off Sunday morning. I come to Bible study. I'm coming to my 12th. Even when you come to the 12th, you come, you give God glory, and then you look for an opportunity to be a blessing to your brothers and your sisters. Many of you is getting picked. Reconnect. Thank you, Holy Ghost. Reconnect. And the second thing, and I'm done. The first thing is to give God the glory. The second thing we do is that you desire God's plan to be fulfilled in your life. You want your giants defeated because you desire God's plan to be filled in your life. He delivered you and I, brother boy, so his plan could be fulfilled. And you are doing it too, son. You're reaching back, helping those others come out of the same thing God brought you out of. God is concerned about the body. God is concerned about the loss. Every one of us, now that God has set us free from many different things, don't mean we are perfect, but every last one of us should have in our heart a burning desire to invite as many people as we can to come experience what you are experiencing at going off of Christ Church. I wonder how many of you are really praying. We got a prayer three card that we're getting ready to recirculate through the, through the church. Prayer three, you should have at least three people in your Bible every single day that you intercede and praying for that you want to believe God to come to the house of the Lord and get saved. Whether they get saved out there, but you want to see them, my God, sitting beside you. You should always be praying for three, Peter, James, and John. You should always be praying for Peter, James, and John. You should always be inviting people to the house of the Lord. Don't you want people to experience what you're experiencing? Use your Facebook and social media other than for something other than what you're using it for. Use it to advance God's kingdom. Use it to torment the enemy. Quit liking all that stuff, my God, that don't matter, and start posting stuff that do matter. Oh, my God. Mm. So you want God's plan to be fulfilled in your life. 2 Corinthians 4.17, write that down. It says, for our present troubles are small and won't last very long. Yet they produce for us a glory that vastly outweighs them, weighs them and, will last, and will last forever, God's glory. One of the reasons you and I don't see, church, that our jazz fall like we want to is because we are often praying and operating from wrong motives. Read that again, and I'm through. One of the reasons you and I don't see our jazz fall like we want to is because we often we are often praying and operating from a wrong motive. Put scripture on it. James chapter 4, verses 1 through 3. It says, what is causing the quarrels and fights among you? Don't they come from the evil desires at war within you? You want what you don't have, so you scheme and kill to get it. You are jealous of what others have, but you can't get it. So you fight and wage war to take it away from them. You do not have what you want. Listen to the scripture, James. You do not have what you want, going off of Christ and guess, because you don't ask God for it. Well, Pastor, I've been asking. I've been asking. Okay, well, watch this. And when you ask, <laughs> you don't get it because your motives. This is the Bible. Because of your motives. Let me read that again. You, 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 you. It says, you do not have what you want because... You do not have what you want because you don't ask God for it. And you saying, yes, I do. Okay, I believe that. And even when you ask, you don't get it because your motives, my motives, your motives, my motives are all wrong. Somebody need to catch that. What is your motive for why you want God to do what you ask him to do in prayer? Do you want it because you want to be able to flaunt something in somebody's face and say, ah, oh, you, you thought I wasn't going to be nothing, but look at me now. See, that's the wrong motives. Are you posting pictures of you, my God, because you want people to lust after you? Wrong motives. Yeah. Are you trying to post stuff on Facebook because you're trying to attract some filthy, come on, some filthy man because you need some attention because you can't at least be yourself without somebody? I'm keeping it on the dollar. And so your motives is wrong. Yeah, All this is applicable right now. Check your motives of why you're doing what you're doing. Yeah. Check your mo mo Facebook and, and social media and Instagram has been an enemy yeah. to the Christians. Yeah, yeah, yeah. It has brought terrible exposure, my God, and it really has told off on people that profess to be Christians. Because yeah. one minute is God, God, the next minute is every cuss word in the book. Y'all yeah. oh, oh, in the club, my God, going live and stuff like that, and then you up there going for Christ, dancing, and you know, come on, somebody, it's a mockery. Yeah. Yeah. And you're frustrated, I'm trying to help you, but your motives is wrong. Yeah. Oh, this is a clean house word. Down go Goliath. 
on the count of three. One, two, three. Down go Goliath. One more time. One, two, three. For the third time, one, two, three. And James said, you want only what, you, what God would, it says, you want only what would give you pleasure. You only want what would give you pleasure. That's one of the reasons why I feel, I, notice what I'm saying, I feel, Sherrod, that God has not allowed me to take a salary because I had to show people that my motives is right. I had to show people. That's why pastor don't draw the salary. And I got a call the other day from one of my partners. He got to doing 17 years in the penitentiary living in Texas. And he'd been looking at all the stuff on YouTube. He said, pastor, peanut, baby, popcorn. And he told me. He said, man, I want you to hear me, and I want you to hear me good. I said, what's that, popcorn? He said, don't feel bad. He said, the pastor's word of their heart. Here's a man that's got to doing 17 flat. Ain't been out for two months, two weeks. And watching, hunting me down, found me, heard all about it. He said, a, 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 a pastor's worried of their heart, Cousin Sean. And he told me, he said, don't you feel bad whenever that time comes. Can I tell y'all something right now? I'm being transparent because I'm just real. I have still not crossed over. When it comes to accepting money, a, a, a salary, 50, 60, 70,000 their salary, I just ain't there yet, cousin. y'all, y'all look at me, stay with me, because I don't want none of y'all to ever question who God has called me to be. And I received that cover, Sean, because even Popcorn said the same thing. And you didn't even know he said that, but you prophesied this now and prayed the same prayer pretty much that he prayed. So God is talking to me, but praise be to God, we'll work that out. But I need you to look. Ask yourself. All across the sanctuary. What's mocking me? What am I not confronting that my children would have to confront? But it's not their giant. It's really my giant. But I'm going to pass it off on them because I'm tired. I've done the best I could. I've raised them to the best of my ability. But now I'm tired. Let them deal with it. Mm, my God, my God, God is talking. I don't know why some of us are still sitting. We should be all at the altar because everybody got a giant. If you choose to stay, it's okay, it's okay. My God, but what is your giant? What's standing in your way? What's standing in your way? What's standing in your way? Oh, my God, what's standing in your way? 